We are now going to have a much needed discussion about the many important issues connected to indigenous food and agriculture. From the role of seeds to ceremony and the spiritual connection that we have to our planet and the plants we grow and eat, we are long overdue to bring the revitalization of indigenous food systems to the forefront of discussions about food justice. I'm personally looking forward to learning a lot from this discussion. I'm very pleased to welcome my daughter, Corinna Gore, founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and a member of the faculty at the Earth Institute at Columbia, and Sean Sherman, the founder and CEO of The Sioux Chef and co-founder of North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. I'm so happy to be here talking uh, with you, Sean Sherman, and I want everyone to know how much um, we have enjoyed as a family and, uh, and our friends as well getting to know your work. Uh, this has been possible because we can look at your website on the internet, and um, I ordered this wonderful cookbook, um, The Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen, which I highly recommend and have been uh, enjoying. And there are a number of wonderful pieces on your work online. The PBS NewsHour did something last year. There was a, an article in Indian Country Today just last week or, or earlier this week, maybe. And so um, I am just delighted and honored to have the chance to talk with you personally as part of this conference. So thank you so much, Sean, and welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much. So let's start with a with a basic question. What do you mean by decolonizing food? Well, our focus is really on indigenous studies and uh, indigenous communities and indigenous food systems when it comes down to it. So when we started our business a few years back um, and we wanted to try and bring indigenous uh, perspective into the culinary world, into the mainstream, um, we worked hard to try to figure out what that means because we weren't trying to reproduce recipes per se from 1491. We were really trying to take an understanding of our indigenous ancestors and apply it to today's world. So we were looking at uh, what people were eating. We were looking at the regional diversity of all of our amazing food systems, both wild and agricultural. We were looking at the animals that people were utilizing. We were looking at how people were preserving foods, who were, uh, what kinds of foods were being traded. Um, and to really kind of create that modern sense of indigenous food and indigenous lifestyle. So we um, started by cutting out um, colonized ingredients that didn't exist here not that long ago. So we removed um, dairy, wheat flour, cane sugar, even beef, pork, and chicken, just to showcase uh, a diversity in protein choices. So interesting. And uh, what, what does this mean for uh, for you, for our educational systems and our, our cultural institutions, what could we do differently to bring this kind of knowledge out to more people? Well, for indigenous education, we really took the time to try and define what that really means. So if you look at um, what that is, it's basically thousands of generations of knowledge being handed down um, family after family, generation after generation, giving indigenous people basically the blueprint of how to live sustainably utilizing plants and animals of their region. Um, and that education is extremely important and it's unfortunate that we really lost a lot of that as indigenous peoples through a lot of assimilation efforts um, throughout the 1900s. And um, it was a really damaging time period for us as indigenous peoples. And we're working really hard to put that indigenous perspective back on our education to learn what's more important, you know, to learn about the plants around us, what they're good for. Is it food? Is it medicine? Can you craft with them? Um, learning about all of our stories and our, um, our cultural significant pieces when it comes to our connection with the plants and the earth. And there's just so much to learn. Um, and we really want to bring a lot of health and culture and strengthen those pieces back in indigenous communities um, specifically. But we also want um, everybody to have access to this um, really amazing knowledge base that basically slit, sits on a global scale when you look at indigenous peoples around the world having that same commonality of being so connected to our land and our space. 
And you're working now in something called the Indigenous Food Lab, as I understand it, uh, based in Minneapolis. And I know you've been very active during this uh, coronavirus pandemic and really meeting the needs of, of people in the community. Could you tell us a little bit about the Indigenous Food Lab? Yeah, um, so we're right in the middle of Minneapolis and we are actually just a few blocks um, from where um, our, one of our community members, George Floyd, was murdered and we're right in the middle of a lot of where the social uprising happened in Minneapolis. So basically the building that we're in, all around us, there's just a lot of destruction. So when that happened, we got our kitchen up and going um, and we've been feeding um, upwards to 400 people a day um, just to help out our community because there's been a lot of food insecurity, not only because of COVID, but also because of just this destruction that happened here in Minneapolis. And we are just doing our part to make sure that that our community members are fed um, and we're kind of staying in our lane and serving just healthy indigenous foods. Um, so Indigenous Food Lab is a plan we've been working on for a while. It's a part of our nonprofit, which is called NATIVES, um, which is an acronym for North American Traditional Indigenous Food System. And our two main goals with the Indigenous Food Lab is to create awareness around Indigenous education and create awareness and access to Indigenous foods. So we're using ourselves as a model for training, education, development, and support. So we're hoping that we work directly with tribal communities in our region and vicinity, helping them to create their own culinary programming for their community, which could be something like a small catering operation or even a full-scale restaurant if they have the means to do so. And being a development and support center for them, showing how to cook healthy, modern indigenous foods in their community that's designed to be about that community in their language, utilizing the foods around them, um, both wild and domesticated, and helping them with um, just the education piece to that. And we're hoping that we can replicate this model, open up indigenous food labs in cities all over the place, and being uh, each one being a regional center point for more training, development, and support for indigenous food um, systems, especially within tribal communities. And again, like we see this on a global scale, so we're hoping that we can eventually crawl throughout Canada, Mexico, Alaska, and even beyond. We can be in Hawaii, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, India, Africa, and to help really secure indigenous knowledge for the future. Wow, that, it's such great work. Thank, thank you for all that you're doing. And I, I've, I've read um, and heard you say that the, the connection to land uh, and to food uh, is also a, a source of health. And health is, is physical and also mental, emotional, and uh, some may feel comfortable calling it also spiritual. And I wondered, um, if you could talk a little bit about that connection to health. And I know that you have a, 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 a slide um, that you might be able to show us about what an indigenous food system looks like. Uh, so if you could talk us through that a little bit and talk about, about health, individual and communal health as well. So absolutely. So when we're looking at indigenous food systems, it's more than just culinary. Cause it's basically, again, it's that blueprint of how to live sustainably within our regions. And it's celebrating this diversity instead of kind of shunning it, you know. And we see um, it's just so important for us uh, in this generation to be stewards of this knowledge base and to source out as much as we can because indigenous peoples live so closely with the land and we're so spiritually connected to their foods, both wild and domesticated, whether they're uh, rare heirloom seeds that are still alive today or just these plants that we see around us. It's just giving people the understanding of how important this knowledge base is for us as a human race to move forward in a more sustainable and organic way. Um, and it's also really focused on um, how people, again, how people are surviving, which is through regional um, food systems. You know, it's so important that we support and create more community-based regional food systems um, for the livelihood of all of all of the people in our community. Um, and it's just such a great role model to look at indigenous communities and how they have made that their lifestyle for generations upon generations and millennia. So um, there's just so much for us to learn. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of indigenous um, models have been completely ignored throughout the colonization um, of basically the planet. <laughs> and uh, we just really feel like there's, um, there's going to be a great future if we can really embrace a lot of these indigenous values. Wonderful. Well, we, 
No, and and we're very happy that there is this burgeoning field of thought and action around regenerative agriculture, and people are talking about permaculture and rotating crops and biodiversity as part of our agricultural systems. And I know that 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is actually in the hands of indigenous people. And you have written and talked about how uh, a lot, some of these concepts are very much part of, a, of ancestral wisdom of indigenous people. So I wonder if um, you could share what it's like to, uh, to be in conversation around permaculture and regenerative agriculture coming from your perspective. Well, I think it's really important to first understand the immense diversity out there within indigenous communities. I mean, we still have 573 tribes in the U.S. alone, 622 in Canada, and 20% of Mexico still identifies as indigenous, which is a huge population. And when we're looking at that immensity of diversity, people had figured out all sorts of different ways to live sustainably within their areas utilizing what we would call permacultural designs today, helping their land spaces grow a lot of really important foods, um, especially carbohydrates in many different areas. And also it's just looking at, um, you know, how the different kinds of seed diversity that's still alive out there, you know, because we celebrate modern agriculture so much, but we also know how damaging this is to our soil and the amount of chemicals that's going into it, that's getting into that soil, getting into our water, getting into our communities and getting into our own bodies, you know, so it's really dangerous and the seed diversity we should be protecting because each of these really unique seeds, especially um, with these indigenous varietals of corns and beans and squash and sunflower and chilies, tobacco, things like that. It's really important to understand like each one of these unique seeds has a very unique story to tell coming from a very unique community. Um, and these stories are so important and it carries so much health because you look at indigenous diets and how um, healthy that those diets are because they're low glycemic, they're immense in, in plant diversity. There's so much plant diversity in these diets. They're eating healthy protein, lots of good fats. And it's just something that we can all adapt to live a little bit better. You know, we look at the Western diet that has really um, done very little to incorporate a lot of uh, plant diversity in its diet. And you know, so a lot of people are probably living off of less than 20 plant species because you think about what kind of plants you buy at the grocery store and you're buying the same things over and over, some tomatoes, some garlic, some onion. Whereas indigenous peoples had such an immense diet because they were utilizing all these plants that were growing through the different seasons, knowing which parts of the plants to utilize, um, using it for food and for medicine and staying healthy because it's not just our food pantry, it was also our medicine cabinet that's, that's right around us. So we just hope people kind of open their eyes, see the world a little bit differently and, you know, stop calling everything a weed. That just means you don't know what it is. So like take the time to learn what's out there. Yeah, I, I love I love the way that you incorporate dandelion in some of the recipes for, for many of us that is a, a plant that is so common and often treated as a weed and, and you've really revealed and demonstrated the nutritional um, aspects of dandelion. And that's just one example of, of, of the wonderful work that, that you're able to share with us. Um, thank you for that. And I really would love your thoughts on the climate crisis and how this work um, that you do, that you've described, uh, this decolonizing, food decolonizing education, thinking about indigenous knowledge and reconnecting to the land, um, what does that have to do with the climate crisis? Well, I think it's really important that um, we understand how connected Indigenous peoples are to the land and how adaptable Indigenous peoples have been throughout history. And what's going on with the climate change is, it, you know, uh, people who are so connected to the earth can see it happening in real time. Like things are changing right before our eyes. And we're going to have to figure out how to change and adapt with these mass changes that are happening. Um, indigenous peoples here in the U.S. that already had to deal with that in the 1800s and early 1900s as their whole lifestyles completely changed by being pushed onto reservation systems and mass deforestation happening and the introduction of cattle ranches and barbed wire fences disrupting all sorts of natural flow of natural life. Um, so it's really important that we remain to be adaptable and resilient when it comes to this um, and to just understand how we're going to be able to um, work with these changes and protect these natural resources instead of further damaging them, um, protecting our waterways, which is going to be so important for the future. 
you know, and also just, you know, looking at all plants through an indigenous perspective. So for the dandelion, for example, it's obviously not indigenous to the Americas, but we're not shunning plants because they're not necessarily from here. We're looking at it from an indigenous perspective and thinking, what is this good for? Is it food? Is it medicine? How can we utilize this? And how, you know, how can we just utilize our land space better? Because we have the technology and the ability to let, to landscape any way we want to. So why not do that for the purpose of food and health? You know, so if we can have 30 golf courses in Palm Springs, think what we could do with that technology by putting food all over the place for people that really need it. Oh, wow. That's such a beautiful vision. Oh, thank you. Um, well, finally, I, I wish we had more time, but I want to just ask you finally, um, what, are, what, what are some of your favorite things to make these days? And, and do you have a, a photo you can show us of some of the dishes that that you are specializing in? Well, we just really like to cook where, wherever we are and make food taste like where we are. So for example, um, uh, you, you can, we can have walleye and crab apple and wild plum and dandelion and oxalis. And literally you can stand on a lake in Min Northern Minnesota, look around and see all those ingredients right around you without even moving. You know, So I think it's really important to think about food like that, to make your food taste like the region that you're in and to think about how much cool diversity there is. And especially if you look at it from that indigenous perspective, you're gonna see it because it's cultural and flavorful flavor a diversity that's sitting across the board. So we envision a world one day where we can help hopefully create many indigenous focused restaurants that are um, run by indigenous peoples on the land. Um, so people can drive across these nations and see how much amazing diversity there is, you know, and it's going to be supporting those local regional food systems, supporting, supporting those cultures, and people are going to get to benefit by uh, just being able to taste all this amazing food. Thank you so much, Sean Sherman. We're really honored that you joined us and very much looking forward to hearing more, learning more about your work. And I'm going to try one of these recipes uh, myself too soon. So thank you, Sean, for being with us. Thank you and Palamaye.